We'll see if any of y'all are awake. All right. So, I don't know if anyone's on right now. I'm going live on Facebook. So I'll be posting this video everywhere. But before I start, I want to just say with this video, this actually started from, I want to, I want to consider it yesterday. I didn't really sleep. Uh, I think it's one in the morning. It's about to be two in the morning. And I was getting ready to go to sleep. Well, actually I was asleep. I wasn't getting ready. I was asleep for like maybe an hour. I went to sleep at, I think it was 10, nine something, close to 10 uh, p.m. So when I went to sleep, later on I have this, this brother, my brother in Christ, I don't know why, called me. Juan, if you're watching this, you know this was you. You had some part in this. Woke me up. I couldn't go back to sleep after that. And I was tired, so when I tried going back to sleep, I couldn't. So then I started praying. I was like, you know what? If I can't go back to sleep, I might as well just pray. But before all that, throughout the day, yesterday, uh, when I was praying, I heard three words from God that he gave to me. So just... With this video, it'll be three words, which is the title of this video, what God had told me. And when I was praying, he said, bruise the head. And I'm wondering, what do you mean bruise the head? <clears throat> so, bear with me. I know this, I'm probably, it's going to seem like I'm going from place to place in this video, but just try to keep up and pay attention. I'll try to break it down as, as much as I can. Um... It's, it's in so much depth from just the three words. God had me go in so much depth in this. So I was, when I was praying, he was just showing me this. So this is bruised the head from God's word. Now, this is what he was showing me. When he showed me the words bruised the head as I was praying, uh, he took me all the way to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Some of you already know the story of Adam and Eve with the fall of mankind, the very first sin, the forbidden fruit. When Satan, he was in the form of the snake, the serpent, who deceived Eve. And later on, Adam was deceived. And that's when the entire world was cursed because of the fall of man and sin. But I'm going to show you a deeper understanding of that from God's way of what he showed me. And all with scripture. Scripture is the highest authority, so scripture speaks for itself. In Genesis chapter 3, 15, I'll read it in the New King James Version so some of you can understand it. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now, when I was reading this, everyone already knows this. This is when God is speaking to Satan, telling him that he's cursing him. And when he says he's going to put enmity, he's already prophesying about Jesus. Because that seed that would bruise, that would bruise his head would be Jesus. And when uh, he says Satan will bruise his the seed's heel, meaning Jesus will be crucified, but that's God's way of showing it. But then later on, God started to show me a deeper understanding of enmity. When God says that he would put enmity between Satan and Eve, meaning uh, the line that comes from Adam and Eve, then all the way to Jesus being born, I started looking at the definition of enmity. So the secular definition of enmity means hostile, opposed, or against uh, someone or something. But the biblical meaning of enmity has a deeper understanding. So the original word of enmity is Abba in Hebrew. The Latin translation is enemicus, which is animosity and hatred. And we see in the Bible, enmity with God is a declaration of war. So when God says he's going to put enmity with Satan, meaning I'm going to war with you, now you made me hate you. Because of what you did to my greatest creation that were made in my image to mankind. I'm giving you like a paraphrase of Genesis. But then, where, where else can we see enmity mentioned in the Bible? In Romans chapter 8 verses 6 through 8. I'm going to read it all so you guys can understand this and I'll break it down. In Romans chapter 8 verses 6 through 8. It says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, meaning hatred against God or war against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then these who are in the flesh cannot please God. Some harsh words, but it is truth. So the carnal mind is hostile. 
And it's a war. It's a hatred against God because it's enmity against God. So just like how God put enmity between Satan's seed and Eve's seed to have Jesus and the descendants of God versus uh, Satan's spiritual descendants, how much more will it be with us hating God when we have that enmity against him when we live in the flesh? Because it says the flesh cannot please God. So it, it is hatred and because the flesh does, it naturally, we don't want to submit to God. Now let's move on to the second part of that verse of Genesis 3.15. The seed. When he says, and between your seed and her seed. So the seed is also an offspring. Now we know that the offspring from Eve all the way until David and, and so on, and from Abraham and so on, is leads up to Jesus and the physical side. But there's also a spiritual side too, and there's also a spiritual side for Satan himself. Because Satan doesn't have a physical seed, but he has a spiritual seed. So, he, that spiritual offspring of Satan, you see this in John chapter 8 verses 37 all the way through 47, where actually the Pharisees and the scribes, when they're trying to test Jesus, they're asking him the, all these questions, or I think that's also the time with the adulterous woman. The adulterous woman in the very beginning of John chapter 8 and all these where the Pharisees are trying to find a way to to um, prove that Jesus is wrong, that his message is wrong. They're trying to prove. They're trying to find ways to either destroy his his teachings, his word of what he says. But you see in John chapter eight verse thirty seven to forty eight or forty seven, Jesus the way he rebukes and the way he addresses these Pharisees and scribes. Look what he says here in verse thirty seven. I know that you are Abraham's ascendants, he's talking to the Pharisees, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father and you do what you have seen with your father. It's kind of harsh hearing that from Jesus. So they answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. So these Pharisees are so mad at what Jesus says and they tell him, well, Abraham is my father. And Jesus says to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But you seek to kill me, a man who has told the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father, then said, you do the deeds of your father. And then later on, you see the Pharisees, they say to him, we weren't born of fornication. We have one father, that's God. So you see these religious people, they tell Jesus, well, I'm not like this other person. I'm not a fornicator. I'm not this. I love God. So they're boasting upon that. And they're comparing themselves to other sinners when they're just as bad. And Jesus says to them, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he that sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. And this is how he's comparing them to Satan himself when they follow after him. He was a murderer from the very beginning. And does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for it. He is a liar and the father of it. But he, because I tell the truth, you don't, you do not believe me. Which, and this is where Jesus tells the Pharisees, which of you convicts me of sin? Because Jesus is proving he has no sin. So there is no way they can prove him wrong. And if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. Now, what do these scriptures teach us? For one, in verse 37 of John chapter 8, the Pharisees and scribes, they were descendants of Abraham, actual descendants because they were the Jews. But if you apply this to Christians of the modern church today, of Christians, believers, people who consider themselves Christians today, they act exactly, or I might say, just as bad as these Pharisees because the Pharisees trying to talk to Jesus saying, well, I am, I'm, I'm a, I'm a child of Abraham. So, and I'm not born of fornication, meaning, oh, I'm better than all these other fornicators and all these other sinners. But yet Jesus, he addresses the issues and tells him, well, I don't see your fruit. And, but how this, how else is this applied to believers today? Well, as Christians, can we be Christians, but deceive ourselves with the desires of Satan Meaning, we don't like being convicted as Christians today. We don't like being convicted. The modern church doesn't like being convicted or held accountable. So we immediately go, especially Christians of today. I've noticed this. Every time I preach to someone, a lot of people get real mad with me. And, or pastors will do this. And 
pastors will preach to someone and a lot of people, especially the young generation, will get mad. And as Christians, we immediately go to Matthew chapter 7 saying, well, I'm a Christian. I go to church uh, and don't judge because the Bible says not to judge. But yet they fail to read the rest of that scripture of Matthew chapter 7. And which actually says that to take out the speck or some other translations of the log out of your own eye before you try to pluck it out of your brother's eye because otherwise you would be a hypocrite. Now, does it say not to judge? Not specifically. The Bible doesn't say not to judge. It says not to be a hypocrite while judging because God is the ultimate judgment. God, he is the one that should judge everything. But if you see in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 13 through 15, it shows that there is such things as righteous judgment led by the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit's teaching you to have certain judgments, not to have the ultimate judgment of condemnation, but the ultimate judgment, uh, but to have the smallest judgments, because the spiritual man judges all things, but he is not judged himself. Meaning, if God is telling you to call out something, it's because it's supposed to be convicting, so that person can get out of that sin. And that's all I'm giving you the scriptures for that. But you see in John chapter 8, verse 44, Jesus calls the Pharisees the children. He addresses them as children of the devil of Satan in the spiritual sense, meaning the spiritual offspring. And this is what shows from Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. It shows that they were, um, it shows that that seed can be the Pharisees of today, even and so on for the world that follows the ways of the enemy himself. So Jesus was, he wasn't just an example of a physical seed, but he also showed that we can be examples of a, a spiritual offspring of God. And it's all in Romans chapter 4, verses 16, where the Apostle Paul is talking about us being justified through faith. But he uses, I like the way how Paul uses this. He uses Abraham as an example uh, to be justified through faith. By, through faith, by grace alone. And that grace, his name, of course, is Jesus. But it shows that when you get into the faith, when you become born again, believers, and you're falling, you actually, you're following Christ. Because it shows when you do all of those things in obedience to God, you don't just become a child of God, but in that sense, it's kind of like it goes back to your heritage. You were that child of Abraham because Abraham, it started with Abraham all throughout the covenant, which led up to this point. And because of all that, we are... Uh, children of Abraham in the spirit because to be children of Abraham is to be a, a child of God if that makes sense and now I know it might seem a little bit confusing but let me explain in Romans chapter 4 verse 16 the apostle Paul says therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace so that the promise might be sure to and I underline this all of the seed not only to those who are of the law but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham so that's you and me because we're not Jewish, obviously, but who is the father of us all? That's you and I. So now back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I'm trying to stay on point here, but I want you guys to understand this so you can understand uh, the context of Genesis 3, 15. So what does it mean to bruise the head? To bruise the head. Jesus bruises the head of Satan because Satan bruised the heel of Jesus at the cross because Jesus is at seat from Genesis 3, 15. He bruised the heel at the cross. When Satan thought he won, he didn't know that Jesus was actually fulfilling the promise that he said in Genesis 3.15. He didn't know that. He thought he won when he killed him, when he had the Jews turn against Jesus, the Pharisees, and the people that actually were followers of Christ back, uh, back then. But this is what God was showing me. He, he led me actually back up to Isaiah chapter 53. Now the entire chapter will show you a, a better context of Genesis 3.15 and so on. But Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah prophesied, uh, he prophesied Jesus coming and he knew, I'm sure God gave him the word to speak this prophecy of, of Isaiah 53, showing how Jesus would be uh, crucified for us for all, for the remission of sins for the forgiveness, for this opportunity for us to have everlasting life in heaven and not hell. So I'm going to read from Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10 through 12. This is what really stuck out with me. And when I was writing all this down to give, to have these notes for you guys, I was actually crying because, you know, I, it, you feel that, that love. I, I felt God just 
you know, comforting me as I was writing that. And I'm like, wow, I, it's it's refreshing. Like over, I've read this verse, these verses so many times, but it's always refreshing. It's always new. You never get tired of it. So verse 10, yet it is pleased, or yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, talking about Jesus. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong, meaning number or length, uh, extend his days. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, may my righteous servant shall justify, of course by grace, justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Now, if you knew from the Bible's terms, when it says dividing the spoil, uh, even from the times of Moses, when the Pharaoh told Moses and the Jews to get out because they, after all the plagues that were happening in Exodus and so on, uh, the spoil, he's saying, get out of here, take all the spoil. I mean, the spoil is the riches or the gold, the treasures. So when God says that because of what Jesus did, then we're able to have the spoil divided for and for each and every one of us that are in Christ when we endure to the end. So when it says that he divide, he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he poured out his soul unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors and he bore the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Now because Jesus was bruised, because he was bruised for us, we have that opportunity for everlasting life. And if you see from Isaiah chapter 53 verse 12, when it says that he was an intercession for the transgressors, which is for us. If you understand the definition of an intercession, it's to intervene on someone's behalf, meaning to get in the way of someone's behalf, to fight for them. So in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, God intervened for humanity because when he saw what Satan did, when the serpent, what he did and deceived Adam and Eve to commit that sin, and when the entire, we could have been in hell just like that. But when God saw all of that, he didn't, he didn't condemn Adam and Eve. He went to war for them. He went to war for us, for you and me. So how much more for us? Because listen here, God declared war for us. Now this is like a mind blowing thing with just three words he gave me in prayer, bruise the head. And he shows us how to bruise the head because it shows why did God say bruise the head? Because every day is the time to bruise the head. Because we're bruising the head of what Satan tries to offer us. We're bruising the head, and that's why Jesus was the ultimate example. Sometimes we have to get into we have to get into fasting and prayer together with one with one another and one accord in the church. And we have to come together, we have to bruise the head together. And there's gonna be times where Satan's over here whispering to you and he's just giving you th this temptation of the spiritual fruit, then he wants you to take that bite just like how we did with Adam and Eve. But this is why God's telling you, bruise the head. Bruise the head of the serpent and cut it off. Crush him. And how do you crush him? You can't crush him on your own strength. You crush him when you're in Christ. So every day is a time to bruise the head. When the Pharisees and the religious people, the scribes of today are telling you, well, you don't know what you're doing. I mean, I'm not a fornicator like you. I'm not, I'm not this way like you. But... We have to have some backbone against these people that persecute us. We have to have some backbone and we have to stop being afraid of preaching against all sin. And we have to be, we can't be afraid. We have to stop being afraid of preaching against homosexuality. We got to stop being afraid of preaching against the sins of lust, of, of pornography, of fornication, sex before marriage, all these other things. And when people are, when we're being persecuted and there will come a time when we will be persecuted for just trusting and believing in Christ, this shows that to bruise the head could be also be trusting in God because when we trust in God, we bruise the head of Satan himself. Or when the world offers us the fleshly desires, we have to bruise the head. And to bruise the head is by submitting to God. Now, what does Satan hate most? How do you bruise the head? Go back to Genesis chapter 3 or even Genesis chapter 2 when God made Adam and Eve. When God made Adam and Eve, Satan didn't like this. He was jealous of us because we were made in the image of God. And what do we know? That Satan hates us because we're made in the image of God. And he hated us, or he hated Adam and Eve back then because, and he still hates us today because as we're in the image of God, 
God wants us to submit to him because when we submit to him, just everything falls into place. When we're, when we're glorifying God, everything's just perfect when we're glorifying God. But when we get out of the will of God, when we're in rebellion against God, this is Satan's, that's Satan's way of victory. But what is Satan's defeat? Is when we are sub when we're submissive to God, and that's a whole context, just a still a small portion of bruise the head. I hope you guys understand this, and I wanted to go back to sleep, but there's times where I God wakes me up in the middle of the night, and He doesn't let me go back to sleep until I give these preachings or teachings. Uh, so if you if you learned a lot from that video, or if you already understood. Um, if you understood the context of Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 on bruise the head, if you already understood that, then, you know, that's good for you. But if you understood it on a deeper level, then share this video if you were really touched by this, because I was crying as I made this, as I was writing this down and as God was speaking to me. Yeah, God still speaks today. But share this video if you're, um, if you've learned a lot from it. I know I did. I mean, I didn't understand this until he showed me it. But if you're if you need any prayer requests or anything, don't be afraid to reach out to my fiance or me. Or if you need a church to go to, you're always welcome. Uh, you can always reach out to us. And if you have any questions about some scriptures, and please, please feel free to message us or anything. Uh, and, and just share this video. I, I know this is going on different pages. Um, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, my channel. And if you don't have me on my YouTube channel, then you can go on... Uh, let's be real. That's the name of it. And it's just stuff like this. It used to be a secular channel with just a regular vlog, but God has called me to give these types of teachings for you and with the wisdom. So it's not just for me. It's all, it's for all of you. We're here to serve you. So that's what it's all about. But I think I'm going back to sleep because I don't know. I, at first I was wondering why did he even wake me up and this is why. So if you're watching this, I do believe if you're watching this video, then God has wanted you to see this video for a reason. So if you're barely getting on on the, on the live video, go back and re-see it so you can understand the context of how God will go to war for you. I mean, it's pretty crazy how God went to war for us. So have a good night, guys.